I just wanted, this scripture has been on my heart all day today. And uh, it's a beautiful scripture taken from Isaiah 6. So maybe we'll just prepare our hearts before we, as we're waiting for last minute folks. I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew, and they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation. And the entire building was filled with smoke. And then I said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a burning coal He had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Amen. The word of the Lord for the people of God. I think we can get started, don't you? My journey with the Lord's Prayer began about, of course I've recited it every Sunday probably of my life. I started uh, in the Methodist church Oh, I don't know. I must have been three years old. Yes, she says three years old is right. Um, I remember at about four or five going to the altar and accepting Jesus. And uh, there haven't been many Sundays that I've missed being in the house of the Lord. And I have recited the Lord's Prayer in many different traditions and many uh, houses of worships. But it's been about three years ago, four years ago, that I was just, I don't even remember what the situation was, but I didn't know how to pray. Just came to that place where, Lord, I don't even know what to say about this situation. And I just heard this whisper. And then Jesus said, pray like this. And that began my own personal journey of studying the Lord's Prayer. And those, just a few of those things, are what I'd love to share with you this evening. I am not a theologian. I am not a Greek scholar. But I do, <laughs> but I do love my Strong's Concordance. Okay? I've studied the Word from the time I could read. And... Um, it is life, and it is power. So that is um, the purpose tonight. Like I said, just sharing some of the insights that I've received and maybe asking us a couple of questions that can help you in your own devotional life in using the Lord's Prayer as a prayer study. Okay? All right, the Lord's Prayer is rooted in Jewish tradition. And in study, many of the tenets that are found in the Lord's Prayer actually can also be found in the Talmud. So this is part of the tradition that Jesus grew in, but then he lived it. Um, The original prayer was spoken in Palestinian Aramaic. It was translated into Greek by the writer of the Gospels in 80 A.D., Okay, so let's look at the scripture surrounding the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 5. And whenever you pray, 
Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that this evening as we unpack your word, that it would become a living word in our hearts, that our lives would be challenged and cleansed and transformed by the Holy Spirit that lives in this word. And Lord, I just thank you for each person here, and I ask that whatever burdens have been brought into this place, that you would lift them. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's start. We're, what I'm going to do is we're going to take each tenant. I've got to do this on and off. Each tenant and just kind of unpack a little bit of the Greek around it. And like I said, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I love my concordance. And all of you can do this also uh, with the Strong's Concordance. And then I'm just sharing a little bit of insight that has meant something to me in each of these tenets. Does that sound good? Okay. Our Father. Okay, the Greek. The Greek is hamon or hamon. Greek scholars, you can correct me. Plural. It is the word for our, we, us. That seems pretty self-evident. Pater is the originator of all things, who infuses all things with himself to create. Our ancestor, that's one of the words used. Our father denotes relationship and family. Now this, just these two words, our father, can be so powerful. Because usually when we go into prayer, we're usually saying, my father. And there is a difference. All through the Lord's Prayer, the plural is used. So this is a prayer that, yes, God uses it to do mighty works in our own lives, but it's a prayer for the community. So the question that I would ask from this is, who is we? Who is God, the originator of? Do I see humanity as we or as us and them or as me and them? Do I see God as the literal father and source of all creation that I am a part of? Do I allow myself to rest in the fathership of God? What feelings does that bring to the surface? The fatherhood of God. We struggle with that, especially those of us who maybe have not had the most ideal father figures in our life. That sense of rest in the arms of a father our Father. 
What does that feel like? When you say, our Father, who do you imagine resting in God's arms with you? Our Father. If I allow myself to see life in this way, how does that change me? How does that change how I see life and all of creation? Now, I know for me, just this is because our Father, this, those two words, I mean, I have spent many weeks just focusing on those two words. And there have been nights going to sleep where I just think, our Father, Father, and resting because my nature doesn't want to rest. My nature doesn't want to trust. And so that resting and trusting and releasing myself into the Father. And it also creates humility. Because how can I look at a brother or sister, no matter where they live in the world, no matter what they believe, no matter how can I look at them and not see God's child, God's creation? So as I look at the situation in the Middle East and I pray, Our Father, does that mean I'm just praying for the Israelis? Or am I praying for the Palestinian in the Gaza Strip also? And as I look at ISIS and the horrible things that are being done, but these are very tragic, misguided children still of God. And can I pray for them? So these are some of the questions that I ask myself around our Father. Who art in heaven, Uranus, is that how you pronounce it? I'm looking at my, my scholars, no? Okay, I'll keep on. This is a root meaning to cover to encompass. It's the meaning of the universe, not just the heavenlies, but the entire universe, the covering. Our Father who covers us and encompasses us, surrounds us, who is in all things. Now think about that. Science confirms that the same DNA that was in the earliest creative processes is in all living things. Now, I can't dis I'm not David Wilkinson, and I can't, ex I can't explain that. But that is something that scientists are just coming into the realization that the God particle, is what they call it, is in all of DNA. God's signature is in all of creation. So again, those are just two words, or three words, who art in heaven, who art in heaven. What does that mean in my life? For me, to recognize that God is in all things is not to say that God creates suffering. Suffering is an experience that comes as a result of the fallen humanity and the fallen nature of this earth. And there are laws of nature that create death. There are laws of nature that create earthquakes. And that's not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is that in all circumstances and in all of life, God is there. 
our Father who is in all things. Present. So where is a place that you have recognized God's presence in just the ordinary? Where do you see him? When a bird comes to your bird feeder, those of you who follow me on Facebook know that I love my birds. Do you see a miracle of creation? Do you see God in the middle of that? Or is it just a bird on your bird feeder? And have you experienced a time of suffering in which you've recognized God's presence with you? And I can say, yes. Yes. In all things, in all circumstances, Romans 8, nothing separates us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things above, nor things below. No. In all things, God is present. So again, the question, if I were to believe that and receive that and pray that, how might that change my life? Could I maybe rest a little easier? Or maybe let go of control? That's, that's been one of my Thanks, because I, believe it or not, I have a little bit of a type A personality. <laughs> a little bit. And so control, you know, being in control, being, feeling like I've got it. I've got this. I mean, that's been a huge thing for me and allowing myself to release it and let go and know that God is present God is my Father. I can rest in Him. And He is in all things. Let's go to the next slide. And this is, I just kind of put this together. For those first two lines, our Father, the originator of all things, who infuses all things with Himself, and who covers us and surrounds us, and who is in all things. Just that alone, just those two tenets can revolutionize a life as we meditate and pray those daily. Now this one is really interesting. Hallowed be thy name. Okay, we say that every Sunday. And boy, are we praying something dangerous. The name, Anoma, Anoma. The name is used for everything which the name covers. It represents all that you are, your name. When your name is on a document, it represents you. The name of God is over all of creation. All of creation, as we just said, has God's name on it. We are created by God. God is the source. All of creation is part of God's name. Hallowed, uh, this is the word I love, hagiazo, is to render, it's, a, it's like an action word. It's an action word. It's to render sacred, to set apart, to sanctify, to purify, to dedicate to God. Hallowed is a word of transformation. So when we're praying, hallowed be thy name, we're saying, Lord, we want to be purified. We want to be set apart. Set us apart. Transform us. Purify us. Let your glory shine through us. Let us represent your name in all the earth. That's dangerous. I love this quote. And this is Strong's quote. I love it. C.S. Lewis should have written this. This sounds like C.S. Lewis. 
the stamp of sacredness passes over from the holiness of God to whatever is connected to it. Let's say that again. Let's all say that together. The stamp of sacredness passes over from the holiness of God to whatever is connected to it. Just take a moment. As we're connected to God, the stamp of his holiness, his sacredness, passes over from God to us. So what does that mean in our lives? Okay, some questions. Where do I see the work of God's transformation most clearly in my life? And what does it look like? And what does it feel like? It doesn't always feel good. Are you allowing yourself, am I allowing myself, to be a part of the purification process, or am I resisting? Just think on that for a minute. Where, where in your life right now are you sensing that God is stirring you, challenging you, convicting, convicting? Purification. But it is very appropriate that this comes after the first two. Because until we see God, we allow ourselves to see the presence of God. Just like the Isaiah scripture I read. True confession really and purification cannot take place. Because then it's ego driven. We're trying to present ourselves to others as we're, we're good Christian people, okay? And we all have done it. I've, I certainly have done it. But when we allow ourselves to see God and see the fatherhood of God and know that God is in all things and allow ourselves to be in God's presence... Our response then is, oh, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. And then the coal is placed in our heart and purifies us and cleanses us and sets us apart for holy purpose. So like I said, be careful what you pray. We've been praying this prayer for a long time. And God is at work in our hearts. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Hmm. Kingdom is basilia. I like that word too. Basilia. Now it doesn't represent, for instance, the castle. It's the rule over the castle. Okay, the authority to rule. Your rule. The word come is erkomai, erkomai, which means to be established. So Jesus, I can just imagine when Jesus spoke this. I mean, this is not a mamsy-pamsy prayer. This is thy kingdom come. Your rule be established here in this spot, in this moment, here and now. Your rule be established. Will, your will, will is thelima, what one wishes or has determined should be done. The purpose, the purposes of God. And again, be done, genomai, come into existence, come into existence. So we're, this is powerful, you know, this, 
your purposes come into existence in, and this, this, I should have had that on the next slide, but that's okay. In is an interesting word. It's just a little participle, epi, which means on, upon, at, or by, but that literally means breath. That's the literal Greek. I love words. Can you tell? I love words. Of course, earth is the physical world. Heaven is the spiritual world. On earth equals heaven. That's what it's saying. On earth as it is equal in heaven. Okay, so put, if you put this all together, I think the next slide might do that. Yes, okay. Your authority and rule be established. Your purposes and determinations come into existence by the breath so that earth will be as in heaven. <laughs> Just, yeah. Okay. I'm going to let you guys talk to each other for a minute. Because this is, this, is this is a biggie. I mean, I've had discussions with folks. Did Jesus really mean that the kingdom of God could be established here in this earth? Or are we talking about the thousand-year reign and millennium? And Jesus was talking in his day, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are the emissaries. We are the ones who open the door of the castle and let the king come in and say, here, where I am, this is your rule. And I want your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. That's, again, that's dangerous. That's a dangerous prayer. Um, let's go then. Yeah, what does this mean for my life? Okay, just turn to two or three people. I need to make sure you're awake. Um, turn to two or three people and just ask the question, do you believe that Jesus meant this for our day and time? And then maybe how, what would that look like? What would that look like in your life? So take a minute and let's move on. The first four tenets are basically about who God is and God's plan for humanity. For that last one is God's plan for humanity. Now the next four tenets are petitions. These, these are about our daily walk. Prayers for us personally and as a community. Because again, it's always us. Okay, give us this day our daily bread. Now, notice Jesus is not begging when he prays that. He's requesting of his Father, give us this day. Now, Havlan Lakma, I have that, and I think that's probably Aramaic, but I love the translation. Give to us today the bread of our necessity for this day. For this day. That this day thing, I think that is the secret to living in peace, in inner peace. Fear comes when we go ahead of this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread, what is that? That doesn't necessarily always mean, we always think provision. But that can be wisdom, leadership skills, job performance, words in a relationship. Whatever it is that we need in this day, we are to ask God for. Now, I caught, I mean, I, I didn't catch myself. God caught me because my prayer at one time was, Lord, if you will give me this, 
then I will do this for you. Okay? How many of them, if I win the lottery, you know, I will just give it all away. If I, if you do this for me, then I will do this for you. This is not resting in the provision, the daily provision of God. Resting in the provision of God has a lot to do with the trusting in our Father. It comes down to a child who stands before a loving father and says, Daddy, I need this. And the father graciously and abundantly gives to us what is needed for that day. Now, there are several pictures of this in Scripture. Of course, the Old Testament, we have the picture in Exodus where the children of Israel were whining again and wanted to go back to Egypt. And God said, I will provide manna and quail each day as is needed. Only take what you need for the day. Now, God didn't say be scarce about it. God didn't say just take a little bit and your tummy won't be full. God said, take what you need. But those who took more than they needed, the next day was all moldy. Okay, so there's a wonderful picture of each day. Jesus on the mount, feeding the thousands. They all ate to their fill what was needed for that day. So the question is not... I mean, I think sometimes our problem is in our definition of what enough means. Now, there are times when enough in my life hasn't looked like very much because I haven't needed very much. And God provided enough through other people. There were, I mean, there were times Donnie and I really struggled but God always, there was always food on our table. Okay? That was enough. There are days that enough looks a little more than that because that's what's needed. So our definition of enough is very important. God doesn't call us to have a scarcity mindset. I really don't believe that. That's not... That's not what the scripture says. We are to have an attitude of gratitude. And add, <laughs> that I sound like, yeah. Attitude of gratitude changes what enough looks like. I mean, I've caught myself just in these last weeks because I've prayed this and been meditating on it and just remembering at the end of the day to say, thank you, God, I have more than enough. I had food. I, had, I was able to pay every bill that was due today. I had strength. I had wisdom. I got done on my to-do list what was I had to do today. Tomorrow's list is tomorrow's list. Thank you for providing for today. And that was very helpful for me through many challenges where I would start to feel overwhelmed. And there have been times in my life where that's just so much responsibility. There's a sense of being overwhelmed. And this is the scripture that God would remind me. Stay in today. Give us this day our daily bread. And when I would do that, I would find that the strength for each day was there. So that is a very powerful but practical, practical tenet of this prayer. So again, what does enough mean to you? Do you think in terms of scarcity or abundance? Is the cup half empty or is the cup half full? What besides food does provision represent to you? Can you rest in God's provision for this day? 
without worry for tomorrow. So just, just kind of look at those questions. And I mean, for me, provision, there have been many mornings that I sit on my porch. That's where I do my best praying. And my provision for the day is wisdom to lead people. Wisdom to be the director of worship at Long's Chapel. The ability. And there are days, I guess you guys think I I wake up and I'm just like this all the time. But there are days that that feels very overwhelming. And there are days that I would rather just do anything else. And it is that meditation on give us this day, Lord. I need strength this day. I need wisdom this day. I'm going to rest in your presence this day. The next one. (laughs) And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And this one's going to meddle with all of us. Forgive. Afimi, I don't know how to say that. Afimi. To send away. It's an intense word, is what it said in the, in the dictionary. Intense. It's not passive. It's not send away like you're saying goodbye to your grandkid. It's send away. Forgive. Divorce actually has the same root. It's, it's, it's almost got a violent feel like, and I don't mean that in a bad term, but I think you know what I mean. Send away, give up, keep no longer. That's the word for forgive. It's a very powerful word. And debt, ophilima, that which is justly or legally due, that which is owed you. That which harms you or offends you, that is a debt. It's, I mean, this person really does owe this to you. This is not made up in your head. This is something, somebody has harmed you. Somebody has, owes you something. Even as. Okay, so look at that in context. Forgive our debts, put away our ways in which we have harmed others. Even as we, even, sorry, even as we forgive others who have harmed us. There's a condition there. And Jesus illustrates that condition later on in the chapter when he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's right at the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says that. This forgiveness thing is serious business. So, let's just look. What does this mean for us? Who in your life has hurt you? Let's go to the next slide, Savannah. Who? You know, when you have unforgiveness, what happens They may never know, and they probably won't ever care. But you are living this drama over and over every day of your life as long as you hold on to that. Because there's something in us, that subconscious nature that wants to get even, that wants to, I'll show you. And what happens then is we're hurting ourselves. We're keeping ourselves in bondage. And the layers of unforgiveness, it takes sometimes a lifetime 
because God will show us a layer and you unpeel it. And then you go along your merry way and you think you've forgiven that person. And then another layer comes. So it's a process. But as we are willing to let go as those layers come to our consciousness, to our front of, I love this in this book I'm reading, it says, to the front of our thinking mind. I love that. Because that's it, that's it. When it comes to the front of our thinking mind, and as we release it and forgive, as we know I don't want this, I am not going to hold on to this anymore, then another layer of our heart is cleansed. Another layer is freed. Another layer is forgiven. It's this process of cleansing, and it, it is a beautiful process. But it's the, the journey. Okay, what's the name of it? Ultimate journey. That's what that's about. It's about going in and allowing ourselves to forgive. So I, I love this one thing, because I, I wrote this in my journal. Can I forgive the mess-ups? Because basically that's what it is. Nobody, most people do not intend to hurt us, okay? We're probably the last thing in their minds. But can I forgive the mess-ups of others even when it causes me harm? And that's the bottom line. Can I let go of the feeling of holding it over them or making them pay? And where am I holding on to unforgiveness? And I, I mean, I just have to, because this has been probably the greatest work of my life. This is where God has really worked in my heart the most. Because with unforgiveness, our hearts become like stone. And love can't live where there's stone. And so it is that constant forgiveness of thinking back and not, I mean, and you don't even have to, you don't have to be purposeful unless you know something. I mean, there's some things in my life where I know I had to forgive. But there's some things that have just come to the surface. And I could choose in that moment to, oh, or to just, oh. And this is the secret of marriage, too. I know most of you have been married for a long time, so I'm not telling you anything new. But this is the secret. It's daily forgiveness. Daily forgiveness. You can't live with a person and not have to forgive them every day. I'm sorry. You, you just, that is the reality. So, forgiveness. You see how this prayer can meddle? I mean, this is... Lead us not into temptation. Now, lead, again, lead us not, basically is bring us not into or towards. And in the Strongs, it had this big no. So it's basically no, okay? Lead us not. No, I don't want to go there. No into temptation. And this is interesting, the trial of man's fidelity, the test of man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, an enticement to sin, whether coming from inner desires or outer circumstances, diverting us from our divine errand. So, I mean, this... The way that I love to say it is lead us away from temptation. Makes more sense to me in my English understanding. Lead us away from situations where we might be diverted from what we are here for. Where we might be tempted into a situation that would take us off course in our lives. But the key is, do we allow ourselves to be led? Um, somewhere in the Bible, 
It says, don't be like that stubborn mule. Be like the, the horse with the bridle that easily follows his master. Do we allow ourselves to be led? Let me go to the next one. The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. And again, this is about surrendering our will and allowing ourselves to be led. We Westerners, Western Western thinkers, I think we have a hard time with that because we are raised with that American self-sufficiency. And allowing ourselves to be led somehow sometimes feels weak. And yet this is what God this is what God calls us to do is to allow ourselves to be led day by day through life. And as we do allow ourselves to be led, the Lord will not put us in situations that will cause us to divert off of the path that's in front of us. God will lead us into the best pathway. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leadeth me beside the still waters. So, allowing ourselves. I, in, my, in my own uh, thinking and some of you know that I keep talking about writing this book. Um, I call this prayer the prayer of allowing. Because for me, that's what it is. It's a whole different posture. It's a posture of surrendering and allowing God to be God in my life. And allowing God to change me. And allowing God to daily provide for me. And so that's a different feel, a different posture. Allow God to lead us. And there's one more, but deliver us from evil. And that means just what it says, rescue us. Rescue us and evil, um, in, the, in the King James, it says deliver us from evil. But there's an article in there. Okay, that indicates not evil in general, but the evil one himself, the father of lies. So this is a prayer that as we're on this path and as we're allowing the kingdom of God to be born in us and as we're allowing ourselves to be led, what Jesus is saying is the evil one is there and the evil one will lie to us and the evil one will try to thwart us. That is what this is saying. And he's saying, Rescue us. Deliver us. Rescue us. The um, Greek for Satan, Satan, is again, it goes back to the father of lies. And that is the worst evil, is the lies we buy into. There was another translation, and I couldn't find where I read this because it was so beautiful. It was, restore us to the place of the sap within the tree. And those of you, like I said, I love nature. And to me, that's the trueness. The, the sap is where the life is. The tree is where it gets hard, the shell, okay? Deliver us. Deliver us from the lies that harden us. Deliver us from the work of those lies in our lives. Those lies, I mean, we can just get real. Those lies are those little voices that say, you will never amount to anything. You are lazy. You're not good enough. Who do you think you are? Those are the lies. And in this prayer, Jesus confronts that by saying, rescue us. Deliver us from the lies. What would that, what would that look like? What would it look like to live life without those 
insidious lies constantly barraging us. I have to do this. I have to buy that. There's not enough. I don't have enough money. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. We disqualify ourselves from all that God has for us because we allow the lies to roost. And Jesus says, deliver us. It is those lies that's creating the suffering in this world. When you think about it, what is evil? It is anything that is opposed to what God has said and ordained for his creation. And God's creation is meant to be a place of peace, a place of love, a place of common respect. But it's the lies of, I'm better than you. I mean, look at, we don't have to look very far. So that is, the, that, is, that is how Jesus ends the Lord's Prayer. Now, we have added, for thine is the kingdom, that's been added over time, mainly for liturgy purposes, because it sounds better to have an ending. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. But that's beautiful. Amen. Now, I've written just a little prayer. This was something, actually, I led several years ago, one of the Sunday mornings I prayed. But this is where it came from. So maybe let's look at it. It is Caroline's version, okay, of the Lord's Prayer. And it's just putting some of these into other words that um, might help us. Our Father, Father of all, creator of the entire universe, there is no one and nothing that you have not lovingly brought into being as the master artist. The entire universe is your created child. You are in all things. We are connected to you and to each other as children are connected to their father and brothers and sisters. Your realm is ours. You are awesome. You are perfect, abounding in beauty, abundance, and love. All that is good is from you. Your nature is constantly working to set apart and transform all that is connected to you. You are good. We surrender to your authority and rule in our lives. Impregnate your creation with your vision for it. May we think with your thoughts and feel with your emotions. Empower us with your spirit to manifest your vision for this creation. Let earth be as heaven is. Each day that is today, we thank you for your provision. May we continue to receive all that we need each day in order to manifest your vision for us. Your blessings are too numerous to count. Each day, we are amazed at the goodness that you pour into our lives. Thank you. May we dance the dance of forgiveness. You have forgiven us so much. Your love and acceptance has never left us. How then can we not forgive our brother and sister? How can we reject them and not offer them the same allowances that we have offered ourselves? We ask to walk in your forgiveness for ourselves and for each person we encounter, especially those whose actions have harmed us or created pain in our lives. Lead us away from peril. We choose to be teachable, 
so that we might hear the voice of your leading and correction. We pray this not only for ourselves, but for our families, our friends, our nation, and for all the people of the earth. Give our leaders wisdom and grace that they may follow you away from peril and into peace. Deliver us from the evil one. Rescue us from the stories and lies that we have believed and built our lives upon. Bring us to that place of truth that lies within each of us. This is the place that you have created in all of us. This is the eternal flame that ignites us and is our connection to you. Ignite your eternal flame within our souls. May we begin to glow with the luminous glow of eternity. May our lives reflect your truth. All of this is yours. It has always been, is now, and always will be yours. We surrender our lives to your vision. You are amazing, and we love you. Amen. Amen. So thank you very much. And... Uh, Let's just close in prayer. Lord, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. And we thank you for your work in our lives. We ask that you continue that work as we allow ourselves to see you and to know you and to be led by you. As we allow the work of forgiveness to continue And we do ask for your deliverance from all of the lies. Set us free, Lord, as your people. That we can be, as Isaiah said, your voice. Your voice to this community and to the world. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Caroline. Yes, sir. Quay is having surgery tomorrow in Indianapolis. Okay. And I would be so grateful if you would meet us in silent prayer for Susan. Let's pray. She's having surgery all morning long. Yes. In, in Indianapolis. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we lift up Susan. We just lift her into your wonderful, loving arms. We ask that you would give her peace tonight. Remove fear. Lord, place just the right doctors around her and the nurses. Give them wisdom. Be with her and provide full healing, we pray, for her. We pray for Rob, for Julie, for Sarah, for Anna, that your peace will just come over their home and that even in this you are present and we ask for your presence to manifest itself to them this evening and tomorrow. We thank you and we praise you. For you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>